Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Davis, and this is a short mini lecture video on Antoine Saint Exupery's uh, book called The Little Prince. And I'll be talking in this video about chapters 11 till about 20. So um, in the few chapters kind of leading up to chapter 11, so around chapters 9 and 10, we see the little prince taking care of his small planet. And then he begins to visit other planets. Um, notice that the pilot, the narrator um, of the story, who's also a character in the story, kind of drops out of the chapters, um, these chapters. So it's kind of interesting. I talked um, in my notes about, uh, you know, what happens in chapters one to 10 and the pilot narrator is quite prominent in the early chapters of the book. But here we see him dropping off and now we're just focused on the protagonist of The Little Prince. So it's an interesting kind of narrative technique. The book itself is told in first person narration from the pilot's perspective. And yet in these chapters, the kind of middle portion of the book, it very much feels like it's in third person narration. And in fact, it is in third person narration. It's just that we have, um, you know, because the, the pilot is saying he um, when he talks about the little prince. Um, but we know that there's this kind of pilot narrator in the background, right? So in the, in the earlier chapters, when the pilot is talking about his own experience and himself meeting the prince, he uses the I, the first person. And then once we get introduced to the prince and the pilot starts telling us about the prince taking care of his own planets and him, his own planet and him visiting other planets or asteroids, um, then we get the pilot kind of dropping into the background. So it's a, a quite an interesting narrative technique. And I think that we can see the pilot in a sense as aligned with the author. And it's a narrator who is in fact um, a character in the book itself, right? Aligned with the author, which is not to say the same as, but kind of aligned with. Um, and um, yeah, so he narrates from the first person, but then he kind of drops off as a character in those middle chapters. And we'll see the pilot coming kind of back into the story a little bit later. But right now we kind of forget about the pilot a little bit and we get the prince's adventures, um, his existence on his own planet, as well as his uh, journey to other planets or asteroids. Okay, so that's a little bit about the narrative technique. Um, so in chapter nine, I'm kind of going a little bit before chapter 11 here, um, the prince rakes out his volcanoes. He's got three little tiny volcanoes on his planet, which he can just, you can see the picture in the, in the book, right? He just can walk around his planet, even in the, the very front, um, you can see how small his planet is, right? And there's his little volcano, his active volcano kind of spewing out. He's, he's much bigger than the volcano. So um, he rakes out his volcanoes and this is very kind of childlike, right? You can see the child reader appealing to this because this is like a child playing and raking out kind of toy volcanoes in a sense. Uh, but there's something metaphorical going on here too. So he has three volcanoes on his planet. He rakes out all of them. Only two of them are active, right? So, but he says he rakes out the third one too because you never know. And so this theme that this, this kind of message, I'll call it a message, that runs throughout the text quite strongly. And you'll often hear the quote, um, in, I don't know if I can remember it exactly, but it's something like, what is essential is invisible to the eye. This idea that there's something underneath that we don't see that's actually really important is kind of gestured at with the extinct volcano because he says, well, I rate that extinct one out too because you never know, right? He can't see what's underneath because that's invisible to the eye. And I think there's a metaphor to go back to the idea of this, these three volcanoes as metaphorical. I think it's as if the prince is engaging in what we would now call something like self-care, right? His planet is like his house, his home. His body is also like his home and he's taking care of the self. He's making sure to rake out those volcanoes so that they don't erupt. He's making sure to take care of himself, his own mind, his own body, his own thoughts so that they don't get out of control on him, right? So it's a sense of taking care of the self, taking care of one's surroundings, taking care of one's environment that's important. Even those aspects which, 
you know, don't look like they need to be taken care of, like the extinct volcano, even those, you never know, take care of all parts of the self. So that's um, what you see before he goes venturing to the other planets. Now, in chapter 10, he starts going to these other planets or asteroids. Each one has a person on it, okay? So they're very tiny planets, just like his, and each one has a person on it. And that person um, is kind of a warning to both the prince and the child reader of who not to be like, in a sense, right? And these Individuals are also kind of symbolic of problems in society, different kinds of problems. So let's go through the different planets that he visits and uh, which one, you know, who is on each of those planets and what message we might be getting from each of them. So when he arrives, when the prince arrives on the first um, planet he visits, um, there is a king there. Now that's it. There's just one king. Nobody else exists on the planet. And you can see in the picture that the king pretty much takes up the whole planet. It's a very small little planet and the king just sits on it there. He's a pretty much a useless, powerless king because he has no one to reign over there. It's just him. So it's in a way a bit humorous, right? Um, there's a kind of sense of he wants, he thinks he contr he's controlling everything, but he's actually not, right? So he, you know, when the prince says he'd like to see a sunset, the King says, yes, of course I can demand that I'm king. I can do anything. And the prince says, when will the sunset happen? And he just says the usual time when it happens. So he really doesn't have, I think that's showing that he really doesn't have any power. And yet he thinks he does. He's completely mis, uh, misunderstanding his own lack of power. He thinks he has power. He does not have power. And so there's a kind of disconnectedness about the king and a kind of, I would argue, loneliness. He's all by himself there. And a kind of warning there against self-importance, right? He very much thinks he's self-important. Um, so the p prince kind of leaves thinking, you know, adults are a little strange. Here's this kind of powerless king there that thinks he has all this power and there's nobody else to, to rule on his planet over and he doesn't have control over when the sun sets come either. So the prince leaves kind of miffed. The second planet he goes to has a vain man on it. Again, just a single individual, and that's the vain man. And, and I think in a lot of ways, he's similar to the king. He's focused on himself, and he has no connectedness to others. He's the only one there, and he just constantly wants admiration. So I think that one's pretty obvious, a kind of warning against obsession with the self. In both the king and the vain man, we have a disconnectedness, a loneliness, an obsession with the self. On the third planet, the prince finds a drunkard and this man is ashamed of himself and he's trying to forget his past and himself. So again, the same things start coming through a sense of futility, a sense of loneliness, a sense of disconnection. Um, you know, he, he's not a happy man there and he's um, not really doing anything except for drinking and trying to forget that he's an unhappy man. So again, I think all of these similar kind of ideas are coming through. On the fourth planet, there's a businessman. Now this businessman is obsessed with numbers. He's obsessed with his work. And it's a kind of work that seems to have no purpose at all. Okay, so the, the prince kind of questions him on his work. And what you find is there's kind of a, a sense of futility, a sense of um, there is nothing really important about this work. He is counting. He is um, you know, adding up all his numbers of what he thinks is his wealth. He thinks, I think it is, he thinks he owns the stars. He thinks he's counting his, his wealth. Well, the you know, from the princess perspective, there's nothing there. It's kind of an emptiness. It's numbers only. So again, we have this theme of, you know, what's on the outside and what's on the inside. You know, just like going back way to the beginning, um, in my notes, I talked about the box with the sheep in it, right? The picture with the elephant in it, but we don't see what's inside. With the businessman, I think we get the sense that there is actually nothing inside, that there is no constant, there is no kind of important thing underneath those numbers he's counting, um, which he thinks he owns. Okay, so again, we get a warning against this, right? And a sense that the, there's something about the adult society and the adult world, which is problematic because uh, we take this kind of thing very seriously. We count numbers and we, um, you know, we count our money and we think we're important businessmen. And and uh, what's beneath that? 
right? What is the constant underneath? What's the importance, the real importance of that? Why does this businessman take himself so seriously when there's a kind of emptiness underneath those things? On the fifth planet, we have the lamplighter. So this is kind of an interesting planet, similar to the others in that it's a single person on the planet. Um, it's a very small planet. In fact, there's it's sunsetting constantly. So the lamplighter is running off of his feet, trying to light the lamps um, each night so that a star can shine, right? So that there's light. Um, but his, his days go by so quickly because he's on this little tiny planet that has sunsets constantly. Um, that he literally cannot keep up with the lighting that he has to do. So that part of it is problematic. But interestingly, the prince likes him the best of all the people he's met on the different planets or asteroids so far. He likes the lamplighter the best. Why? Because he says why. He's the only one so far that seems to be doing something for someone other than himself. Right? He's doing, he's lighting up, he's lighting the lamps for others. Now there may not be any others on his planet, but he's, he's making a star for others to see. And there's stars are talked about quite a bit through the whole book, seeing them from outside different, different planets, right? Um, and we also might think of the metaphor of what it means to light something, to light something up, to shine knowledge on something, to give one's knowledge to another, to yeah, spark something, right? So I think that this notion that the lamplighter is doing that, and it's not just for him, it's for someone else is what the prince likes about this person and what he sees valuable about the lamplighter. It's also worth um, noting that the lamplighter is the only one that can be considered laborer, okay? So in all of these kind of professions that these individuals represent on the different planets, the lamplighter is the only one that really could be classified as a laborer. And typically in our society, laborers are, laborers are undervalued. They're paid less than businessmen. They're undervalued in our society. But the prince sees him as the most valuable in society. Okay, so that's something that I think, again, the author wants to draw our attention to. And again, these are all problems within kind of the larger world that these individuals on the planets represent. And it's supposed to be a lesson for the prince, but it's also supposed to be a lesson for the child reader and arguably for the adult reader, if Exubery had that reader in mind as well. It's a very philosophical, as you can see, philosophical book. So, you know, lots argue that it isn't just written for children, it's written for adults as well. On the sixth planet, we have the geographer. Now, the irony in this figure, again, only one on his planet, is that... Um, Oh, maybe he's not the only one on his planet this time because he says the explorers come to him. Maybe they're from other planets. Maybe they're, they're from his own. I'm not sure. But he record. He never leaves his study. He records the geography that's reported to him, but he never leaves it. And he says he doesn't know, you know, what the mountains look like when the prince questions him on that because he says he's not an explorer. So the geographer is kind of making a um, distinction here between the explorer and the geographer himself. The explorer being the one who actually goes out and experiences the world and then reports to the geographer and then he, the geography, just sits and records it. So I think that the warning here is that, you know, the geographer, he only has book knowledge. He doesn't have any personal knowledge. He doesn't have any personal experience. And so there's something missing there for the geographer in that sense. And I think that the prince notices that, right? Well. He doesn't have real understanding because he hasn't gone out and experienced it. He's only lived within his books and recorded it. The other thing that's important in this section is um, the fact that this section draws attention to the word ephemeral and the prince asks what it means and um, the geographer explains what it means. And so, you know, the author, Exupery, is really drawing our attention, the reader's attention to this word. And I think it it plays in to that overall idea again of something um, important, something essential, something constant being underneath that we cannot see, and some and and other things being kind of shells for for what's underneath. And so um, the you know the geographer says we don't record anything that's ephemeral because it may not be there the next day, right? And the prince kind of has this crisis, realizing that his rose is ephemeral, that she doesn't, she is not going to live forever. He's, she's not gonna be there like the way a mountain would be for years and years and years. 
Um, and yet, we'll see in the coming chapters that there's kind of something to be learned from this that I think the geographer, in a sense, is wrong. Maybe the prince is even trying to point this out to the reader in not recording that which is ephemeral. That is especially what we should record are those things that disappear, but those things that actually point to something more constant, something more permanent underneath or within them. Um, so the seventh planet is the Earth. And with that planet, um, there are a number of things happening. It's not just one individual that the prince meets, and some of the individuals he meets become more like guides, okay? So that it's not so much warning against what to not be like, but they're kind of guides for the prince. So I'm gonna end the video here. This takes us about up to chapter 20, and I will do another video talking about the rest of um, the story, where I will talk about the prince's relationship with the rose. I'll talk about the fox as a kind of guide figure, and I'll talk about some biblical allusions in the text. Thank you for listening.